Hey, this is the final part of my four-part Cowboy Bebop series. Check out the other parts if you haven't already to view things chronologically. Here we go, right into episode 20, where the Hat Man cinematically floats around Sepia City while some freaky clones escort Ronald Reagan to his doom. Meanwhile, Spikey silently succeeds at billiards as the mysterious assassin guns down the president's entire convoy. Oops, wrong place at the wrong time. Spike finds himself engaged in a gunfight with a balloon wizard. This round source uses his anti-gravity abilities to pull off some BS combo, which probably breaks all of Spike's bones. A stray cat sends Big Boy into a mental breakdown, allowing Spike to flee in a fiery explosion. The bulbous butcher catches up, revealing his collection of weaponry and chasing Spike into a nearby river. Sometime later, Jet's old pal Bob comments on Spike's lack of luck. He warns Jet about a man named Mad Pierre. Spike struggles to eat an orange and is verbally abused by Faye. Mad Perot is a killing machine who has slain seven other high-ranking ISSP fellas. No one who has seen his face has ever survived. There he goes, gracefully off into the distance. Ein gets an email and decides it's better to get Ed to respond. Edward transfers responsibility to Faye, who deciphers the message. It's from Pierre, who wants to meet with Spike to probably clean up loose ends. Faye tries to keep the email a secret because Spike will likely go off and die. He finds out anyway and gets going to the rendezvous point. It's a close down amusement park. Mad Perot does some wizardry and activates the whole park, starting their fight. They do battle in an ice cave. Jet gets Ed to wiggle around in the ISSP's secret files. They do battle in a strip mall. Pierre is immune to bullets. Goofy is not. They do battle on a roller coaster. Spike falls into a river while Ed struggles to gain access to a database. New information is revealed. Peepo was the product of an unethical scientific ISSP experiment in an effort to create a super soldier, I guess. This cat is suspicious. He was designated as a failure due to becoming deranged, but escaped from the facility before they could secure him. Pierre is now essentially just a psychopathic child with superhuman abilities. Faye shows up to help. Pierre is delighted and causes a vast amount of property damage. An animatronic cat terrifies the poor murderous loony, causing him to go ballistic. Spike becomes cornered, and they stare at each other for about 250 two million years. Mad Pierre sees the sus cat in Spike's soul, missing his kill shot and taking a knife to the leg. He begins to cry from the pain, revealing his unfortunate mental state. A big animatronic dog gives him a stomp, forever ending his suffering. Spike feels emotions of some kind. I too also feel emotions of some kind. Jet got a cryptic email from an old pal named Pal to seek a sacred beast, and now wanders through a Martian city narrating his own short story. Pal is some kind of renowned Martian Feng Shui master. Jet did some googling and found that Pal has died, unfortunately. While visiting Pal's gravesite, a little girl gets Jet involved in a shootout. She divines an escape route with her circle, and they are pursued through the city, eventually plopping into a river. Jet is confused. Later, on the Bebop, Spike and Faye deliberate the identity of their new passenger. She is Pao's daughter. Pao was involved in a hyperspace accident, presumably suffering fatal injuries. Jet informs the girl about his connection with Pao and of the inauspicious letter. She becomes enthusiastic and determines that Jet's arrival is part of wacky Feng Shui business involving the location of a relic called the Sunstone. Jet narrates his story in a noir fashion as the motley pair go searching around town. The girl's name is Meifa. She is a student of feng shui, the act of analyzing the natural magnetic energies of the universe to predict events. She laments her dad's untimely death as Jet subconsciously becomes her new father figure. He digs himself a new hole to metaphorically bury himself in and eats an entire ice cream cone in a panic. Later, on top of a skyscraper, Mefa figures out Pao's riddles, and they run around town some more. The Mafia have sniffed out their tracks, however. Mefa finds the Sunstone, while Jet uses his bounty hunter instincts to pull a sneaky on their pursuers. They're from the Syndicate, who are after Meepo because they can't find Palpa. The defeated thug is looted by children. Mefa suddenly says that Pao is alive, so I guess he's out there somewhere. Jet narrates all that while dramatically walking around again. The Sunstone turns out to be a piece of the moon, 
from the gate incident. Spike and Faye's cigarette smoke sends Jet into a protective frenzy, causing him to designate the living room as a non-smoking area henceforth. Mayfa doesn't know what to do with the stone, but Ayn does. Lufa deduces that she can find her father using the magic rock. Ed Nyanyanyans adds some matrixy biz, while Faye and Spike discuss Jet's relationship with Mifa again. She reveals that she has daddy issues and questions her father's identity. Jet informs her about Pao's past as a consultant for the syndicate and his defection from said group. Pao was only looking out for his family by distancing himself. Ed keeps nyanyaning as the bebop travels through hyperspace. They are under fire from the syndicate. Spike and Faye deploy to ward off their assailants. Jet conceives a plan to release the energy contained within the sunstone and has Spike blast it with his laser. Hyperspace is fractured as a result and Pao's hidey hole is revealed. He uses feng shui to lure his daughter there so he could say his goodbyes. They have a short-lived, heart-wrenching reunion as his connection is severed. Jet narrates the ending as entropy revolves back around to normalcy. The Super World Trade Center 2071 is nearly bombed by a smug police officer. Spike tells the villain his own name, Teddy Bomber, and threatens him with jail time. Teddo recognizes Spike as a notorious bounty hunter and goes to fulfill his jihad. Spronk took the pin out though so no boom today. No. Todd Bomb is beaten up, but reveals that he has planted several bears. A whimsical whistle foreshadows the coming of Andy, Spike's alt-colored doppelganger. Andy mistakes Spike for the bomber and tries to arrest him. Teddy gets away with domestic terrorism as Andy tramples over Spike. Sometime later at the Bebop, Spike splurged all their money on hospital bills while the rest of the crew doubts his tale. Ed finds proof of Andy's existence and clears Spike's harbored delusions. Andy is more criminal than bounty hunter, as he has over a hundred cases of property damage. Mr. Bomber is preparing to indulge in his hatred for tall buildings while attending a costume party. Jet and Spike accost the pyromaniac, but are interrupted by Andy's dramatic western-themed entrance. Jet is mistaken for Toddy Bombo. The real Teddy reveals his identity due to the frustration of being ignored, and once more causes terror. Faye flirts with Andy in an elevator. Teddy is pursued by the two cowboys, who end up causing more destruction than the actual criminal. Teddy is ignored once again. Andy's narcissistic goon cave is louder than a drag queen's undergarments. Faye is fed soup and a heaping dosage of cringe while trying to understand him. They toast to Andy's reflection as the night continues on. Sometime later, Faye returns with a souvenir and comments on how similar Spike and Ekips are. Spite is enraged. Teddy Bomber sent a serial killer letter to the TV people, but his speech is once more cut short. Ed finds the next target, while Jet and Faye pass on Ted's bounty. Spike stubbornly continues his warpath, however. At the destined battle site, Teddy is once more ignored. Addy approaches upon his horse. Teddy continues to be ignored while Spike and Handy fight. They are both lured into Tobo's dastardly elevator trap, where he reveals his villainous plot. Once the cowboys reach the skyscraper's precipice, they will explode. Unfortunately, Andy and Spike are constantly stepping on each other's toes and can't seem to escape as a result. They explode. Faye beats the sauce out of Ted for his bounty, then watches the two gremlins crawl around on top of that pyramid. Meanwhile, Spike and Andy enter a melodramatic duel amidst the building's rooftop ruins. They comically fight to a standstill, causing an inevitable collapse. Andy mistakes the building's natural reaction to being exploded for one of Spike's attacks and surrenders. He retires from bounty hunting right then and there, placing his hat upon Spike, mounting his horse, and trotting into the sunset to the edge of the building, I guess. Spike brags about his complete victory over Andy to Jet while eating cowboy soup. Teddy Bomber at last gets to speak his mind. He wanted to make the people aware of major socio-political motives for colonial expansion or something like that. Andy interrupts his monologue by riding past dressed as a samurai. Ted reflects on how his efforts were ultimately a waste of time as he is consoled by the officer beside him. An old guy representing the Illuminati explains what a soul is while tripping balls on TV. He beckons the viewer to abandon their body and embrace the soul. I guess it's a cult which is trying to matrix people. The news reveals just that. There is some trouble surrounding the whole ordeal involving suicides and zealotry. Oh, look. That's Faye. She looks terribly hollow. Spike 
Ed and Jet view the news while eating their mushy dinner. Jet reads a Wikipedia article on the cult's leader, Dr. Londes, who has a significant bounty. That explains why Faye is involved. Jet goes on to read that Londes had a vision from God one day and started to develop some tech to store people's souls. Since then, he created an electronic transcendence group called Scratch. Faye crawls around in the ruins of some kind of technomancer's labyrinth. She suddenly gets the wibble wobbles from the various monitors. Jet, Ed, and Spike begin their investigation, but struggle to find clues as to Londe's whereabouts. Even the TV people are befuddled. Unfortunately, due to low ratings, the bounty hunter's scheduled programming is no more. The crew meet up, but have yielded no results. Faye facetimes the Bebop, pleading for assistance, then passes out. Spike goes for the rescue while Jet tries some VR gaming tech that Scratch uses. Ein gets fidgety at the freaky poems about death that the machine is reciting. Jet gets mind controlled by the hypnotic patterns, but Ein breaks Londes' spell with his dog magic. Jet informs Spike of his findings while Spork goes to become a member of the cult. Ein gives the mind control a try and ends up hacking into London's giga brain, finding that Londes never existed to begin with and everything points to a single location. Jet and Ed don a disguise while Spike wonders the cult's empty always. He eventually discovers Faye lying unconscious at the base of a pyramid of screens. Jet tries to lie his way past the security guard with some clever improvisation, <laughs> while Londes' electronic homunculus soul or whatever he is speaks with Spike. Jet tugs at the guard's heartstrings and is allowed to pass. Spike questions the culprit for his reasons. Londes states in poems that the people decided to start a religion, not him, that it wasn't God who created humans, but humans who created God. Jet and Ed find a regular looking guy on life support, who is probably the mastermind. Spike attempts to lure Londes out of his hiding place, but fails. Jet hacks into the comatose fella's medical machinery, while Londes proclaims television to be a religion. Spike begins to experience the wibble wobbles, and instinctively tries to gun down his opponent. Right before losing consciousness, Spike comments on Londes' childlike behavior, catching him off guard. Jet begins to make headway on disconnecting the technomancer from his electrical cocoon. Spike Mike watches on as the notorious Londes vanishes from existence. Later, Jet reveals that the man he unplugged was Ronnie Spangin, a 13-year-old prodigy hacker who became a vegetable a couple of years ago. He goes for the arrest. Faye awakens to a pleased Spike. Ed and Jet walk away dramatically. Londes makes one last appearance to soliloquize about God again. Faye watches her forgotten memories repeatedly on TV, pausing on a stone lion. Ed recognizes the imagery, but is only sleep talking, I think. Edward is violently kissed on the lips, out of frustration. Spike cinematically brushes his teeth, while Jeep tries to figure out where they are. It's Earth, and the women are gone. They're headed to the familiar stone lion, with Ed strapped haphazardly onto the top of Faye's car. Meanwhile, a couple of cool scientists investigate the meteor crater. Ed's delusions led Faye to a pile of trash infested with orphans. The children of the corn attempt to harvest Faye's fingernails, but are chased away by a nun. Ed is recognized. Later, Fed is fed raw fish and apologized for being hosed. She inquires about Ed's history. The nun states that Ed always just comes and goes like a stray cat. Faye decides to flee but Ed convinces her that the urchin heap was a pit stop for food along the way. The nun gives Ed a parting gift, a hologram of her father. She casually tells Faye that Edward's dad has been looking for her for seven years due to forgetting where he put her, and that he visited a couple months ago to see if Ed was around. Here he is, doing some cool science experiments with his gay lover. Faye was led to her destination, but remains melancholic. An old woman boasting some rad wheels recognizes Faye as one of her old homies. Memories activated. The fortuitous encounter blesses Faye with valuable information on her past, revealing that she was a victim of a terrible accident. The woman compares her appearance to that of a ghost by commenting on Faye's youth. A little girl comes to collect her grandmother, who introduces Faye. Our femme fatale suddenly decides to embrace her spectrum anonymity and makes a hasty exit. The nun's words echo through her mind. People have to cherish what ties they have. Back on the bebop, Faye is scolded for altering the ship's course while Ed shows Ayn her dad. Faye is depressed. Jet and Spike find a spicy new bounty who looks familiar. Apple Deli Sinus Heat Sap Lube Fan. Edward's father. Egg.
Apple Deli can't remember his assistant's name. Another meteor to prod at lands nearby, interrupting their breakfast. Faye is depressed. She has a brain blast in the shower, abruptly recalling her lost memories of times long ago spent with people she once knew. She peers so deep into that abyss that she even remembers her life-altering disaster. Faye has an identity crisis in the hallway. Spike is confused. Faye skedaddles after a brief conversation with Ed about figuring out where one belongs. Spike tells Jet about Faye's dis desertion, and the two get to tracking their bounty. They find Applesauce and his purple servant reveal themselves to be cartographers trying to map every meteorite strike that hits Earth. The bounty hunters are persistent and get the egg. Spike and Apple Deli have a martial arts bout where Spunk is deftly repelled. Ed makes a grand entrance, and the eccentric pair merrily perform gymnastics together. Spike and Jet are shook. Apple Deli headbutts Spike, thanks him for taking care of Ed, and gives him eggs. It turns out that Ed put a bounty on her dad so the hunters would chase him down. Another meteor calls Apple to his duty, leaving Ed behind once more. Faye wanders the streets of her youth, entering the vestibule of her past, only to find it weathered and ruined from years gone by. Spike is given a pinwheel. Jet makes makes boiled eggs. Ed and Ayn depart the bebop, leaving a message in blood, and Faye has a psychotic episode in the remnants of her family's house. As I cry, three or four manly tears while writing the script for this episode. Spime and Jim eat eggs vigorously as Eb's hastily duct-taped pinwheel spins in the wind. Mars. Julia. The elders are on the move. Vicious is up to something. I should have expected it to be murder. He is scolded for trying to stage a coup. The wrinkly freaks decide to take him to the punishment chamber. Not before Vicious can unleash a rad one-liner though. That. Jet and Spike drink away their sorrows at a bar and are suddenly ambushed by some gunmen. Spike gets a free drink. Nice. Jet is wounded, but Shin, Lin's brother, comes to their rescue. He informs Spike of Vicious's failed coup and warns him of the fallout to come. Shin goes on to state that Julia is taking refuge in the city of Tharsis and recommends that Spike should seek her out. Jet gets patched up and urges Spike to not get involved. The visions of Julia won't stop pouring into his thoughts, however. Spike recalls their parting words as he left the syndicate. Spike and Julia attempted to flee from the violence and live a peaceful life. Vicious caught wind of their plans however, sparing Julia's life in order to force Spike into his current circumstances. Faye continues to have an identity crisis at an airport, or spaceport, I guess. The ex-bounty hunter TV host guy goes to pick up his mother. Faye gets a phone call from Spike, pleading her to rendezvous with them at Tharsis. She doesn't intend to return. Julia rides by in her convertible, clearly under a lot of pressure. Faye decides to get involved for some reason, toasting the baddies and hopping in with this strange woman she's never met before. Faye is pleased by the sudden violence. Some time later, Julia thanks Faye for helping out and they discuss their circumstances just enough to not realize that they are basically cousins. On the drive back to Faye's boat, they introduce themselves. Julia instructs Faye to tell Spike that she will be waiting. Faye is shook. Julia enigmatically drives off. Back on the bebop, Jet tells Spike a story where the moral is to keep looking to the future instead of the past. Jet once more cautions his partner to forget whatever happened and move on. Spike counters by stating that his reasons are driven by a longing for part of him which he lost. Julia. The piece of his spirit that roams eternally distant. Spike cannot simply move on because the husk which presents his health as Spike is not him. Faye has returned. Jet gets a call from his old pal Bob. He tells Jet about the Syndicate's troubles and how the Elder Triplets are out to annihilate anyone who could possibly threaten their control of power. Spike prepares for battle. Faye has an abrupt change of heart, but Spike's spidey senses have already detected her approach. The Bebop is under attack. The crew man their stations as Faye relays Julia's message. Spike deploys in his little ship. Vicious is sentenced to death, while Spike Spike charges onward. Julia waits at the destined rendezvous location as a dogfight breaks out in space. Vicious's parrot explodes into smoke, allowing him and his buddies to continue the coup. The space battle nears its end. Jet urges Spike to go find Julia, and he flies away. Vicious declares himself to be the king of space drugs while standing over the wrinkly dead guys. Spike and Julia have a star-crossed meeting at last. 
Julia reveals that she was meant to kill Spike and be free afterwards, but decided to flee instead. She questions Spike's love, then beckons him to uphold his promise of a peaceful life with her. Shin discovers the scene of Vicious's coup and is berated for failing to kill Spike and Julia. Meanwhile, the two lovebirds find Annie gravely wounded. She recites poetry with her death rattles, requiescat in pace and a son. Spike robs Annie of her heavy weaponry with intent for revenge. The Bebop, its crew, and Faye's vehicle are pretty messed up. They're in an emotional upset after Spike's departure and discuss Julia's characteristics. Annie's store is shot up by syndicate goons. Spike and Julia are chased onto the rooftops as the fighting follows. Julia is gunned down from behind after not checking her blind spots. She cinematically falls to the ground. Spike holds her closely as she utters her last words, redacted. For dramatic effect. Meanwhile, Jed asks the old wizard where Spike is. He responds by stating that Spike is being reborn from a dying star, or something like that, and that he may yet die. Jed is enraged, but encouraged by the old guy's poems about not fearing death. Vicious is hot on Spike's trail. Spike returns to the Bebop in the dead of the night to eat weird salad. He tells Jed a story suspiciously resembling his own, which ends in the protagonist finally dying after a great tragedy. They have a good laugh together, and Spike begins to head off to resolve his past once and for all, cryptically stating that Julia has died. Faye tries to stop him by pointing out his hypocrisy. Spike counters by stating that his own circumstances have trapped him in both the past and the present, that his life since leaving the Syndicate has been like watching a dream he would never awaken from, and now that dream is finally over. Faye reveals that her memories returned, but there was nothing left. She becomes defensive about Spike haphazardly throwing his life away, to which he states that his conflict is not to decide whether he lives or dies, but rather if he has been living at all. Faye expresses her emotions by unloading a few rounds into the ceiling. Spike heads out for one last adventure, leaving the others behind to embrace his inevitable reckoning. He enters the Syndicate's headquarters from the front causing a wake of destruction and havoc as he traverses the building. Shin comes in with the clutch save, leading Spike to Vicious before his heroic demise. With his last words, he compels Spike to kill Vicious. The two warriors meet for one last showdown to the death, exchanging words before their duel. Spike's vitality is waning, putting him at a disadvantage. Vicious inflicts a couple of superficial wounds, but in turn is disarmed and shot in the shoulder. Spike informs Vicious of Julia's passing, and they inflict deadly wounds upon each other. Spike recalls Julia's parting words, this is a dream, to which Spike agrees that all this is a bad dream. The new leader of the syndicate smiles, utters bang with his last breath, returns to the soil, and that is the end of Cowboy Bebop. Unless Spike didn't actually die. There's all kinds of symbolism implying that he's dead, like the doves and the slow pan to the fading blue star. Either way, the open-endedness of this anime is part of what gives it that special dreamlike charm, I think. I'm gonna go stare at a wall for a few hours to psychologically recover. I hope you enjoyed this series. I sure did. Like and subscribe. Patreon. Thanks for watching. Bye.